Hello again, fellow psychonauts. Today I'll be discussing one of the most well-known concepts from American psychonaut and philosopher Terence McKenna, what he called the Archaic Revival. I think it's time for an updated analysis of the concept because it is still a fairly popular theory within psychedelic spaces. I'm going to start by summarizing this idea, then attempt to give a decolonial critique. Quickly before I start, please consider subscribing if you haven't already, as it is a free way to help this channel. Alright, now that you're subscribed, let's get into it. The Archaic Revival is the theory that so-called Western culture has grown sick, and that it's in the process of reverting to an older, left-behind style of living in order for the Earth and humanity to heal. Here's that concept in Terence's own words. And we created history slavery, standing armies, urbanization, monotheism, monogamy, materialism, militarism, and all the other isms that are destroying the planet. And so the way back is through a kind of archaic revival. And the whole of the 20th century has been about this. Everything from jazz, Surrealism, psychoanalysis, abstract expressionism, rock and roll, house music, body piercing, tattooing, all of these things are impulses to go back to how it was before history. So there are a few aspects of this theory that I'll be critiquing today, trying to sort through where I think he was on the right track, and where I think there are flaws. There are a few underlying factors as well, such as metaphysical Guyanism and his old time wave theory that I'll save for another time in order to focus on these three main items. One is that Western culture is becoming sick and all the isms that Terence lists that cause that. Two is that old archaic styles of living are healthy and superior. And three is that Western culture is, in his words, like a prodigal son and is in the process of returning to that archaic state. I believe these are the three core components to Terence's concept. The first, Western culture being sick, I think is true. That what we call Western culture, which let's be real, essentially means white culture, is for a lack of better term, toxic. And what I mean by that is that it's greatly harmful to human well-being, the ecosystem, and is currently destroying all hope for a bright future, or for any future. Where I disagree with Terence is in what is causing this culture's toxicity slash sickness. Some of the isms that Terence lists I do agree with, and some I don't, but he misses what I and many others believe is the ultimate ism that is destroying our world. Say it with me kids, Capitalism! Yes, capitalism is a major cause of many of the isms he listed. And it seems to me that Terence was hesitant to acknowledge capitalism's role in this toxicity, though he kind of got close when he said bottom lineism. Perhaps we'll discuss Terence's political position another time. <laughs> but for now, we have to do the obligatory paragraph of why capitalism is the problem, because some of y'all seem to want to push back against that. I read every comment. I know I shouldn't, but I do. Definitely of capitalism. An economic and political system in which a country, trade, and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. What I mean when I talk about capitalism is a social system that prioritizes above all else profit, as in capital gain through means of privatization, goods, and services, you know, basic human necessities. This means that not only is human well-being not prioritized under capitalism, but the competitive social system is actually incentivized to artificially create and maintain poverty for the majority of people. In other words, human lives be damned, future civilization be damned, ecosystems be damned, Bezos and co needs a private spaceship and a new cruise. I want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> it is from this underlying ism that all these other isms are weaponized and reinforced. The wealthy class asserts their dominance through the privatization of capital, but the thing is, private property is inherently theft. All capitalists gain their wealth through the theft, 
exploitation and hoarding of essential resources. Western colonialism was highly motivated by capitalism and is how much of the so-called West was established. When Europeans came to Turtle Island, it was renamed after a European colonizer and was automatically assumed to be the property of whichever European state claimed it first. This is known as the Discovery Doctrine, and the term terra nullius, land belonging to no one, was used in places like Australia. Imagine if dibs was how the world was run. Oh wait, militarily enforced dibs. <laughs> Much of the settler propaganda maintained the narrative that this new world was empty and waiting to be populated. The truth is, it already was. There were hundreds of millions of people who lived there with a way of life that was much different than their own. Now for the second component of Terence's thought, archaic values. I have to assume that what Terence is referring to when he says archaic values is actually indigenous values. Indigenous political structures differ to a fair degree across what is now known as the Americas, and those structures were greatly affected by European colonialism. But generally speaking, their social systems were based on working within and for the greater ecosystem. European powers equated indigenous people with nature, which they saw as something to be tamed and exploited. Once European powers took the land as their own, indigenous peoples and ways of life were to be eradicated, and what couldn't be was to be assimilated into the greater superior capitalist system. Content warning here, I'm going to be talking about some upsetting genocide related stuff, so if you aren't up for that right now, you can skip to this timestamp. In the country I was born in, Canada, European colonizers requested of the British Crown, the dominating power in the region at the time, that the entire 10 million square kilometer piece of land be recognized as a unified sovereign settler state. This state was created by permission of the foreign powers, and the multitude of pre-existing indigenous cultures were not considered or included in the decision making. In fact, many indigenous nations west of what is now Ontario had not made treaties, and still others had yet to make European contact. For example, Joseph Trutch, the first governor of the newly claimed territory of British Columbia, asserted that First Nations had no right to own any land and was about as overtly racist as a person could get. In order to weaken and replace indigenous populations, many brutal and dehumanizing tactics were used. The list includes destroying essential resources like bison, which were driven to near complete extinction, kidnapping indigenous children en masse, imprisoning them in residential schools, torturing them and brainwashing them to sever cultural connections and legacy, and imprisoning and concentrating indigenous populations into small reservations where they were deliberately starved and replacing their settlements with European pilgrims who were told that the land was empty. Also, I can't forget to mention that their cultural practices and traditions were criminalized under the new state laws, just to top all that off. Though the list of colonial crimes goes on and on. Today, indigenous peoples are still suffering from continued land theft and resource deprivation, like food deserts on reserves, lack of access to clean drinking water, housing crises, etc., all while having little to no support for survivors of the horrific Canadian residential schools, the last school of which was still open in 1997. In fact, it was the very medieval Indian residential school where the Kawases First Nation discovered just last month, 751 unmarked graves. <sighs> Despite all these cruel efforts of elimination, indigenous governments and systems still exist. Now the question is, are their political systems preferable to Western capitalism? Yes! Holy crap, yes! Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Indigenous peoples lived here for at least 20,000 years without you know, perpetually instigating large-scale wars and destroying the planet, all without a profit incentive. What? It is pretty clear to me that a big part of accepting the reality of whose land you stand on is to give the land back to its rightful stewards. Speaking of back, that brings us back to the third component of the Archaic Revival, the return or revival of archaic values in Western culture. 
I think there is a big flaw in the language used here, the implications of the time element. Sure, indigenous ways of life have existed for a long time, but it complexly evolved and changed over that time, just like Western cultures did. It flattens and erases much of indigenous histories to suggest that the ways they continue to exist, in spite of an assimilatory culture, is archaic. With this in mind, I don't think we are seeing a return to these values, but rather, they never left. Indigenous peoples were dehumanized by colonizers in large part by utilizing myths, such as the claim that indigenous cultures were primitive, reinforcing the myth of racial hierarchies. The technological advancements of the colonizers, such as guns and ships, was used as evidence to affirm their perceived cultural superiority. Out with the old and in with the new, they say, but even if we were to flip the script and say old is gold, embrace tradition, that really begs the question, which old tradition are we returning to? This is why we need to be able to use dialectic and intersectional analysis when it comes to complex issues such as this. We can't just say old good, new bad, or old bad, new good. These simplified approaches can't appropriately assess the situation. It is my opinion that we shouldn't see this issue as a return to archaic values, but rather the switching of allegiance to existing alternative models as a way to begin to rectify the tremendous harm to humanity and the earth that has been perpetuated by the dominant colonial system. An archaic revival, I think, has the serious potential of mythologizing and appropriating marginalized groups, and that the more effective way of seeing the issue is by striving to be decolonial allies meaning we should open dialogue and really listen to what indigenous voices in our areas and abroad are saying, and avoid the trap of speaking or acting on their behalf. I say to myself, it is going to take a lot more than tattooing, rave dancing, and abstract art to decolonize this shit, fellow psychonauts. In the philosophy of the Haudenosaunee peoples, it takes seven generations to heal from generational trauma, and that it is a principle that we always ensure that in seven generations, they will have food, water, and shelter. Now, fellow psychonauts, at the rate of the capitalist destruction to the planet, I doubt we will even have seven more generations of human, unless we make a radical shift real quick. In the 1960s, it was dropout. In the 2020s, it's land back. So comment land back down below and tell me what you think of this interpretation of Terence's concept. This video was brought to you by the Salvietic Interbeings of Patreon. Sign up at any tier to become one yourself. Or you can support my work by donating to paypal.me slash interbeingart. Until next week, trip safe and sit Nagama.